Hi, this is SynthChaser from SynthChaser.com. Today I'm here with an Oberheim OB1 synthesizer with a dead oscillator. You don't see these synthesizers very often, so I thought it would make for an interesting video. Before we get started, I want to say a special thanks to Doug for the awesome Oberheim shirt that I'm wearing today. The OB1 was the precursor to the OBX, and you can kind of think of it as a one-voice monophonic OBX. It's got two oscillators, a noise source, a filter, and a VCA. You've got separate ADSRs for the filter and the VCA envelopes, and you've got a few modulation options. There's slide switches on each oscillator to mix the oscillators. So down we have off, up we have on, and medium we have softer, minus three decibels. The problem with this OB1 is that there's no output from oscillator one. So if we turn on oscillator two, we can hear that it's working. But if we add in oscillator 1, nothing changes. We'll turn off oscillator 2, and you can hear that oscillator 1 is dead. The customer reports that turning on oscillator sync affects oscillator 2. So here we have both oscillators on and no sync. And if we turn sync on, it sure does affect it. Oscillator 2 is gone now. He also said that another tech has already tried to fix this without any luck. So let's see if we can take care of this for him. Here I've opened up the synth by unscrewing some screws on the bottom panel and taking it off and setting it up on its side in a service position so I can get my oscilloscope onto the boards. But before we uh, dive into the repair, let's kind of have a, have a look around this synthesizer and see what's going on inside. So starting up here, we've got our power supply and I can see that it's been recapped already uh, by a different tech, not by me. This large board that starts here and runs across the entire key bed, so following it down all the way down. This is the synthesizer board. This is the board with the analog goodness to it. Um, you can see there's a little daughter board up here with some uh, CEM3310 chips. Those are envelope generators. So this model uses Curtis chips uh, for its envelopes instead of discretes. Uh, down here, uh, normally there would be a board that comes pretty much over this entire area, and that's called the programmer board, and that has the digital logic, uh, you know, for signal routing and, and stuff like that. Underneath here, normally we wouldn't be able to see the, all of this, but uh, this is the performance control board, the board with the, uh, the, the pitch bend pop and the modulation wheels. So behind here is another board, which is the, uh, the touch buttons board, which has the uh, program memory number buttons on it and those LEDs. And there's another board behind the synthesizer board that we can't see that has all the pots and switches uh, for the oscillators, the filter, and the VCA. So since the oscillator is dead, we're going to focus our attention first on this board, the synthesizer board with the analog stuff. And taking a closer look at it, wow, uh, so much stuff has been changed on this board. It looks like all the polarized capacitors have been replaced, so we see newer electrolytic capacitors all over. Uh, and it looks like a lot of the IC chips have been replaced. So. This is what the, original I, what the original ICs look like. They're these older RCA chips. You can see that it has a 1978. That 814 means 14th week of 1978. So these are original chips, but so many of the chips have been replaced. Uh, some with newer TI chips, uh, some with the NTE chips. Some of the soldering looks a bit sketchy. You can see a lot of flux residue. Even on the component side of the board here, it looks like a resistor got hit in the soldering process. So here's the schematic for the synthesizer board. Fortunately, I have an original service manual because the scans online are pretty low resolution and they're hard to read. Though my old eyes need a magnifying glass to read these as well because they're super tiny. There's a lot of stuff going on in this oscillator schematic. There's no PCB layout we can cross-reference this to. And even worse, none of the parts on the circuit board are labeled. Not the transistors, not even the IC chips. So where can we start in a situation like this? The good thing is there's two copies of the circuit. There's the broken oscillator, and then there's a nearly identical but working oscillator. So we can just go along with our scope and compare one to the other until we find the problem. I'm going to start at the oscillator's timing capacitor because it's physically easy to find. On the schematic, it's here and it's easy to spot in the synthesizer right here because it's a polystyrene capacitor and those are the only ones in the synthesizer. 
And we're already on to something, so bear with me for a moment. With my scope not touching anything, I press a key and we hear just oscillator 2. Pressing the key, when I probe the timing capacitor for oscillator 2 with my scope, the pitch of oscillator 2 changes. This is because the probe of the scope creates a high impedance path to ground. Normally this impedance is so high it doesn't affect the circuit you're probing. But in this case the circuit is sensitive enough that it does. And this is perfectly normal, so that's, that's not a problem what, what we're seeing. But check out what happens when I probe oscillator 1's timing capacitor. <laughs> All of a sudden, we hear oscillator 1 and 2. So I touch, stop touching the, the timing capacitor with my scope, and oscillator 1 goes away. Huge clue that we're close to our culprit. Honestly, I really like the musician who owns this synthesizer, and I'd be thrilled to hang out underneath it, poking it with my oscilloscope whenever he wanted to play it. But in my old age, I've put on some pounds, and I don't think he's got a road case wide enough for my belly. So we're just going to have to do something a little more permanent. And no, we're not going to solder a 1 meg resistor from where I was probing to the ground to simulate me poking it with the scope. Uh, no, no cheesy hacks like that allowed. So let's take another look at this schematic. I just probed the timing capacitor here. This point I probed is the junction between four different parts. There's this NPN transistor on a 3086 transistor array chip that's part of the exponential converter. There's Q4, an N-channel JFET. There's Q7, a PNP transistor. And there's Q2 itself, the polystyrene timing capacitor. I already have a possible suspect in mind, and it may not be the same one that you're thinking. But before we take any guesses, let's try to locate these four components on the board and see if there's any other clues. All right, the timing capacitor, we know we can probe right here. The capacitor looks original, and the solder joints look to be original as well. The uh, collector of Q7 I found to be right here. And I can't tell if the transistor looks original, but it looks like it's been desoldered and resoldered. So I was able to get a better look at the Q7, and it, and it actually looked like it had been replaced. So I found Q4, and the gate of Q4 is right here. And that JFET looks to be original. It matches the one in the other oscillator, and it doesn't appear to have been desoldered. And then the uh, 3086 chip is down here, and pin 8, we can get to... There. And uh, that chip looks to be an old chip. It looks like the original chip. It's in an IC socket, so it's possible that someone uh, took it out and, uh, and tried to, to check it. It looks like the Tempco is not touching the chip there, so possibly someone took it out already. So based on what we've seen, do we know what the problem with our oscillator is? So I suspect the timing capacitor, C2. It's a polystyrene film capacitor which really doesn't age and should never fail. And I bet if we take it out and test it with a capacitance meter, it'll test fine. But I also bet if we replace it, we'll have fixed our oscillator. Let's try it. So I've got the board out and I've placed a small clipping type of heat sink onto the capacitor so I can desolder it without damaging it any more than it may already be damaged. After I desolder this leg, I'll move the heat sink over to the other side. And with the capacitor out, we can measure the capacitance with the multimeter. It's a thousand picofarad or one nanofarad capacitor. And it measures about 1.4, 1.3 nanofarads, which should be okay, right? But I already said I thought it would measure okay. So let's move on to the next step, which is to replace it with a new capacitor. And I'm going to replace the polystyrene capacitor with this, a ceramic capacitor. Capacitor police, don't freak out, just bear with me for a moment. So changing out the timing capacitor didn't fix the problem. So I put the timing, the original polystyrene capacitor back, uh, and I did some more troubleshooting this time from the beginning, from the keyboard control voltage and following that all the way through. And I think the fact that I happened to start by probing that uh, timing capacitor and uh, getting some sound out of it kind of masked the real problem. 
Um, yeah, it was a clue uh, as to what the problem was, but the bigger clue was actually something that I showed you when we scanned over the board. The amount of work and the quality of the soldering job that had been done. What I found was the problem was there's some op amps here that basically buff some, some and buffer the control voltage sources. And the feedback resistor in that, in the one for oscillator one was cracked. The chip was replaced. I'll zoom in so you can see this a little bit better. So you can see that the chip was replaced and I guess when they replaced the chip they cracked that resistor in half. I have some good pictures uh, from the still camera which I'll put up now to show you and I also took a picture of it under the microscope. So when I followed this problem you know from the beginning and walked it all the way through the oscillators I could see on oscillator 2 the control voltage would change with the keys between 0 and 3 volts but when I uh, checked the output of the summing buffer or the op amp buffer for, for oscillator 1 the control voltage for the oscillator was always stuck at 10 volts so the oscillator was always going very fast when I put my a high impedance path to ground on the timing capacitor I slowed the oscillator down enough to the point where we could hear it uh, but that wasn't the problem uh, it put me on the wrong track so one two cent resistor change and now possibly need some calibration there but the oscillator is alive so there we go OB1 repaired I have another OB-1 here that I plan to do a full restoration on. If there's any areas of the OB-1 that you'd be interested in me diving deeper into, let me know in the comments below, and possibly I'll make another OB-1 video soon. This has been SynthChaser from SynthChaser.com. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.